Hello, world. You're listening to Eleanor Wagner's Strange and Scary World here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, where we're always creeping it real. I'm your host, Eleanor Wagner. Let's give a warm welcome to today's guest, paranormal investigator, Bobby J. Gallo of the Gallo Family Ghost Hunters. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting to be here. I'm a fan, so this is an awesome day for me. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. You have quite the resume. Not only are you a paranormal investigator, but you have author, speaker, producer, musician, and magician all on your list of accomplishments. I have to say I'm pretty intrigued with the magician side of you. I've always been fascinated by magicians and how they're able to make things disappear right in front of your eyes. As I understand it, you are a co-creator and headmaster of the International Conservatory of Magic, which is the world's largest online school for magicians. How in the world did you get started in magic? <laughs> well, Can you tell me when it started and where it took you over the years? Absolutely. Well, I basically started doing magic, you know, when I was a small child. And as I talk about in my book, Family Spirits, I was a pretty weird kid, so uh, I was I was just interested in all things like that. And I started doing magic very, very young and always correlated it with the paranormal because magic is, is mystical by nature and almost supernatural. But, you know, of course, with magicians, we are faking it, whereas the paranormal, I have come to believe, is real. But I lost uh, sight of that, you know, for quite a few years and picked it up later in life. With, and then I actually became a full-time professional magician and I toured all around the country and I've done cruise ships, Vegas. I, I did everything at least once uh, as far as an enter- entertainer is concerned. Then I got married. I had a family, kids, and life on the road is really not conducive to having a family. So I went into the corporate world. And what a lot of people don't realize about magic is most magicians actually are skeptics of the paranormal because what a lot of people don't know is that Harry Houdini and Neville Mascalini, they made a career out of debunking the spiritualists of the Victorian age because they thought that they were cheating people and they were defrauding people out of money. So a good portion of Houdini's show was escapes, but another portion was actually devoted to exposing fraudulent spiritualists. So modern day magicians have pretty much taken up that crusade, if you will. And to this day, the vast majority of magicians are skeptics of the paranormal. So I came from a complete opposite point of view. I've always believed in the paranormal. I've had paranormal experiences my entire life. So I wanted to come from the angle of using magic to actually support paranormal investigation by ruling out things that could possibly be man-made or fraudulent or spotting people that are faking things in the paranormal or even finding natural causes to things on an investigation. As a magician, you could do things like that. So I came from an opposite point of view and I've already had magicians tell me, you're a magician, you're not supposed to believe in this stuff. And I'm like, well, I'll read my book and you'll see why. Well, I did get your book and I can't wait to begin reading it. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you mentioned that you're a speaker as well. Does this mean that you go around the country doing beaches for different groups? Well, I'm a public speaker in a couple of ways. Number one, being a professional magician, which I still do on a part-time basis, is a public speaking gig. But I also am a corporate trainer as a day job. So I'm a public speaker in that regard as well. So you could say that I use my voice for a lot of different things. Well, you don't have any fear of going in front of the audience. So that's part of the <laughs> no. You've gotten past that. Well, most people are afraid to get in front of a group of people, so you have no fear, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, cool. it's and you, absolutely well, a fear. You said you're a musician, too, and so that obviously means getting in front of an audience. Do you, yes. what, what instrument do you play? Is there a band that you're in? Not anymore. I play both regular guitar and bass guitar, and oh. I was in a rock band years ago, and around the year, actually in 1982-83, I was in a band, and I wrote all these original songs, and then what happened is around the year 2000, and I cannot believe that was 21 years ago, well, Already, I actually, I actually produced my own album because I wanted to take all the original songs that I wrote and actually record them. So I did that. I've never released it. It's still somewhere in my office here. Maybe one day I will. That's so interesting. I'm a singer too. I, I'm a first soprano, so I've always had a high range. And I was in a band too in my my twenties. But we did oh, like awesome. covers for weddings and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I, I did a lot of singing for so many years. And then when my kids.
kids got older and had ventured out on their own, I got to go back to my writing and I've just committed and devoted myself to just that. I don't really do much of the singing anymore, but for a, a, a long, many years, I was involved in a lot of different groups. So I know that there's a joy in that as well. But then, you know, you refocus your energies and you go to something else and exactly. you, you find yourself in another place, which is fine. You also have published author on your very long list of accomplishments. And as I understand it, you've written a great many books. How many have you written? And are they all paranormal? No, they're not. <laughs> Most okay. of the books I, wow. I've written were for magicians because I was a lecturer on a, on the magic circuit as well. That's something I didn't mention. So I would go to magic clubs and I would teach magicians how to do certain things. So I had so many original concepts that I ended up writing books on those concepts and marketing them only to magicians. There's no ISBN number on any of these books. They were self-published books that I would only market during my lectures. And then on the International Conservatory of Magic that you mentioned, I've written a great deal of that site, but I've also had contributors. But overall, there's almost 2,000 pages on that site and a lot of it that I wrote. So I consider that being an author. Yeah, it's a blog platform sure, instead absolutely. of the written page. Yeah. And there are course, many, you know. many ways to be considered a writer, but that is so interesting. My goodness. Could you tell me a little bit about your most recent release? Absolutely. Well, my life has come around full circle. Back in the early 1990s and late 80s, early 90s, I actually did my very first paranormal investigation. And it was back during a time when the, the term paranormal paranormal investigator wasn't even coined yet, to be honest with you. The only inspirations I had were like old Hans Holzer investigations and things of that nature. So me and a bunch of friends, we went to investigate an old haunted theater in Netcon, New Jersey called the Palace Theater, which incidentally was built by my two great uncles. And there was a lot of paranormal activity that was said to be happening at that place. And again, there were no ghost hunting television shows at this time at all, none. So we basically did it. We were winging it and we called ourselves the Psy Guys because one of the guys said, well, we have to have a name. <laughs> so we went, we did it. Uh, we got a lot of great evidence and we got some activity and we went back there twice and then I kind of let the whole paranormal thing go. And it wasn't until years later when I finally had a family and we were living in South Carolina at the time and my kids found this new television show that you might be familiar with called Ghost Adventures. <laughs> and they started watching okay. it. And my, I have two girls and they both had mad crushes on Zach with a you know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and, uh, I was I was really intrigued with these guys because a lot of what they were doing were things I, I was doing way back in the 80s and I had no idea what I was doing and I, I was like wow these guys are doing stuff that I was doing but yet they were capturing this evidence that really really intrigued me these things called EVPs and things of that nature which quite frankly I didn't even know what that was and I was really intrigued so one day we're watching this and I finally said okay it's time to fess up but I turned to my kids and I said hey kids Kids. Daddy used to do that too. And all of a sudden, the world stopped. And it was like that moment. <laughs> it was like that moment in the movie Spy Kids, where the kids say, My parents aren't cool enough to be spies. You know, it was that kind of moment. And right. immediately, they wanted to go ghost hunting. I told them the story, and they wanted to go ghost hunting. No fear, no hesitation. So I was thinking, Wouldn't it be cool if we could just get one piece of evidence, one EV? one photographic anomaly, anything. I, I didn't care what it was. How cool would that be? Well, we went out and things started a little bit slow, but eventually we were actually capturing more evidence than these guys on TV. And we're talking about real, compelling, paranormal, verifiable evidence. And then we started doing more and more investigations. So one day I said to myself, because I would videotape everything, you know, I'm dad, right? And I said, let me put one of these videos on you. YouTube. And it, ha it happened to be actually a pretty frightening investigation. It was our second investigation. It was probably one of, one of our most frightening ones. And I put it out on YouTube and it went completely viral. It got tens of thousands of views in just a matter of weeks. And it wasn't just the evidence that was intriguing people, but it was the family dynamic. It was the family that ghost hunts. People thought this was such a novel thing. And back during that time, you could count the people that were doing paranormal web series on one hand, literally, because that's how long ago it was. In fact, 
fact, April Abercrombie, who does the afterword in Family Spirits, said, this is great. This is like having another ghost show to watch because it was literally nobody else doing it. So we started the, the series Family Spirits, and we just had phenomenal success with it. So fast forward years later, I said, wouldn't it be nice to have a retrospective on this and give everybody a behind the scenes look at the web series and describe in detail some of our experiences. And that's where Family Spirits came from. Now, how old are your girls today? I have one that just turned 20 and one that's 24. Okay, so ours are close in age. I have a 26-year-old and a 22-year-old. So, I know. I, so they started with you pretty young, though. Yes, they were very young. And that's the thing that's really intriguing. Like Courtney, she was only eight or nine at the time, and she was absolutely fearless. I mean, this is an eight, nine-year-old, and we'd be in a haunted cemetery at midnight, and this girl's out. She wants to find a ghost. She doesn't care. She wanted to find a ghost. And heaven help the ghost she found. And what's really cool about it is it was really a character builder for my daughters. They have just grown up to be the strongest young women because they grew up to be fearless and they realize that there's far more to fear from the living than the dead. And to this day, they love going on investigations. In fact, my oldest daughter went with her new boyfriend and showed him the ropes because he couldn't believe that, oh my God, my new girlfriend's on the cover of a a best-selling book and she's on this web series and she took him out on a couple of investigations. When you did the Palace Theater all those years ago and you said you got evidence, what evidence did you uncover? Cover. Again, this is written about, not only is this written about in Family Spirits, but right now, I guess by, you know, till the end of this month, you could actually go to Barnes & Noble and pick up a copy of Weird New Jersey because they actually did a five-page spread on our Palace Theater investigations. It's all detailed in there. They took some of the material out of Family Spirits, but they also did their own research. But we had poltergeist activity. That we had objects thrown at us. One of the strangest pieces of evidence we got, and even Weird New Jersey thought this was really weird is when we did that investigation in the piano that was on the third floor of the theater that was said to be haunted by two spirits named Malcolm and Jenny, there were fresh flowers placed on top of the piano. The night watchman said that this was requested through a, by the spirits through a medium. And when he asked us what they looked like, I said, wow, well, the place smells like a funeral parlor. They're so fresh. They looked like they were just put up there today. And he blanched. It was amazing. And I said, what's wrong? He goes, those were put up there six months ago. Oh. And Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow. No explanation. No one's watered them, seen to them, anything. These things were almost in suspended animation of sorts. Very, very strange. We, we had other evidence as well. We had what we think might be a spirit manifestation in one of the pictures. There's a piece of lace cloth hanging over the piano that was not there when we took the picture. And it almost looks like it was hanging off an old wedding dress of sort or so, something like that, or, you know, some, some sort of thing like that. And, you know, people can see that. If they, they actually published that picture in Weird New Jersey. So your team comprise you and your two daughters and who else my wife renee and your wife yes and how long had you guys been together now i think actually it's almost 10 years okay what is the family dynamic as far as who does what when you're going out investigating well dad does a lot of talking and i would wager to say <laughs> probably too much <laughs> <laughs> because you know I'm just I'm just a showman by nature that doesn't detract from the reality of what we're doing. In fact, one thing I can guarantee anybody who watches our web series or reads my book that everything is 100% genuine. We don't fake anything. That being said, I do the production, I do a lot of the talking during the series, but Renee, she used to do the dowsing rods. She she doesn't do them anymore because she did have a negative experience with them that I actually don't talk about in family spirits because it was pretty scary. But she used to do them, but now she um, she's like me. She pretty much takes video and does a lot of the production. My kids are pretty remarkable. Nicolette, my um, oldest, Nikki G, she calls herself on the web series, is an empath. She's very empathic. And she can really feel the emotions of these spirits that we are investigating. Courtney can see orbs. And I know orbs is a very controversial subject, but this girl has not only seen them on several occasions, but when she says she sees them, we always take photos in the area where she says she sees the orbs and we catch capture them. 
We've captured dancing orbs on a, a stairway that she saw. We captured that on video. We've captured them floating above her head when she said they were there. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. And so everybody has their own little area of expertise on the show. And when you put it together, it's pretty cool. Uh, but then, but again, you know, the family dynamic is so unique that I think that's one of the reasons we may be capturing so much paranormal evidence, because I think the entities really appreciate how respectful we are and how novel mm-hmm. this is. We don't come in dressed up like Ghostbusters with our matching utilitarian uniforms that these guys love to wear on these paranormal shows and demand that they show themselves or try to use trigger objects oh, I know. insulting their intelligence. We're so respectful when we do this that I think that's why we get the evidence we get. In fact, our greatest piece of evidence is because we were just so ultra respectful to this one spirit who was a revolutionary war hero. We asked him to pose for a picture of us and he did. And that's how we got our first full body apparition. I totally agree with you on the respect issue. My lady Ghostbusters team, mm-hmm. we are really all about the old traditional ways of investigating and we don't need a lot of major equipment. We go a lot with our own sensitivities and like you guys work as a team and each of us has a piece that fits into the puzzle. And like you, I get so angry when people are disrespectful. They only want to be acknowledged and they were there in that place before you were and exactly. you're in their space. And so I, I can understand why if you're respecting them, you get the outcome that you were looking for. You said your wife used to use the dousing rods and you kind of made me nervous there because I used them too. <laughs> and well, you said she had a negative experience and that kind of freaks me out. What exactly happened? If well, you don't I, mind me asking. No, I, I don't. And, and believe it or not, you're kind of getting an exclusive here because I never talk about this on podcasts, but I will today. It was very funny because recently I was reading a Facebook forum called The Afterlife Topics in Metaphysics by a friend of mine, Cyrus Kirkpatrick, who's an expert. He's written several books on afterlife experiences and astral projection and things like that. And he said that he knew somebody who developed clairaudience using the rods. And clairaudience is when you can actually hear the ghosts. It's not an EVP. You're hearing them with your own two ears. And that's exactly what happened to Renee. So when he said that, I was like, wow, that's crazy because my wife had the same experience. After a while of using them and she was so incredible at communicating with these things that there would be paranormal teams all over the world watch our videos and say they never saw anybody work the rods like her. And she just picked them up one day like she was using them her entire life. She had such a natural talent, but she started hearing these voices and they got worse and worse and worse as time was going on. The voices, were they saying horrible things or were they just trying to communicate with her? Yeah, they were pretty, they were saying pretty bad things. Yeah. So what happened is I was trying to get to the bottom of this and I was trying to figure out what was doing this. So one day, I just on a hunch, I picked up her dowsing rods and I took my EMF detector and I put the two together and my EMF detector pinned. And I said, what? I said, these things are not supposed to be holding an electromagnetic charge, but these things were pinned. I came to the conclusion that there was an attachment on the rods. So many spirits Ah. were being communicated that were communicating through these rods. Something attached itself. And I think that was the culprit. So I got rid of the rods. I I agree. I've been told that when you're using your pendulum or you're using dousing rods or any kind of equipment like that, after a couple of uses, you should be saging them and cleansing them in that respect because like you said you can get attachments to them like they get attached yeah i'm pretty sure that's yeah i'm pretty sure that's exactly what happened and and things eventually got better after that it actually took a while but things got better and she's today she's fine but she hasn't picked up a set of rods since i can understand why i get it it was just one of those things but i am lucky enough to have a slew of episodes of her working them so people can see how amazing she was at working those rods. She was just absolutely incredible. That's really all I can really say. Because I I use a pendulum myself. I'm actually really adept at it. But I should probably be doing as you suggest, and that is uh, cleansing them somehow, either with you know salt or sage. Yeah, when we go on an investigation, we bring pendulum and the dousing rods. We have our K twos, and we kind of put it all out there when we're when we're sitting there and we're getting ready to try and connect. We explain everything that we've got because obviously we don't know how old the spirits are that we're going to connect with, and they see right. us with this stuff. They don't know what it is, so we kind of 
explain to them you know what year we're in and why we're trying to connect with them and how they can utilize what we have to to communicate and so not everything gets used all the time we'll be at one investigation and it'll be just the dowsing rods and and, and that's where we'll be getting everything or it'll be just the pendulum you know just it, i guess it depends on how much energy that spirit has yeah. or is able to communicate or which, whichever one they prefer to use actually right. so like you i do write about the investigations that my team goes on and i'm fascinated with your web series and it being all about the paranormal investigations and i'm guessing that you're the producer you do all the producing on that as well right i do i do it was a tough learning curve but and it's funny because if you watch the very first episodes you can see how they just get better and better as time goes on and that was just me learning the tricks of the trade pretty much i'm sure I'm, go I'm going through that right now actually because i've been videoing probably the last seven or eight investigations that we've been on and i have many videos of all of them but right now i'm undertaking the interviewing and the recordings for the podcast so i'm focusing my attentions on that but i'm sure i'm going to get better and better with that as time goes on and then i'm going to focus on the videos as well so one step at a time it is a learning experience for everybody right you have yes, to get absolutely. better at things as you go along so I'm, I'm sure i get it that you probably are all right with that first episode but you like the the, the, the later one so much better <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they yeah. answered it at that. Well, how long is the series? How many ha seasons do you have? We're in season four. What you know, I call them seasons because you know X number of episodes per season. But there's about fifty episodes right now. Oh my! Wow, yeah. that's yeah. great. There's a and lot. you say it's it's all over the country, all, from over, all over the, the country. country? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you're you're still producing. You're still producing, yes. correct? Not as many as we were, but we're still doing them. We've done a lot of famous locations but we really like to do the lesser known locations or places where nobody else has ever been and I'll right. tell you right now those are far more active than the oh, famous, famous ones so yeah we are definitely still doing it we've been all over the country a lot in the south in the north around this area of New Jersey and Pennsylvania of course you know places like Gettysburg St. Augustine Florida Salem Massachusetts you know the more famous ones but we've done all kinds of different locations and it's um it's not only it's easy to find a good place to, to do an investigation, but we managed to do it. And a lot of people will say, well, do you believe in ghosts now? And I said, well, belief passed me a long time ago. I said, right. I know what I've experienced. I said, now it's just a matter of conveying that to other people. And unlike you, we, with the Lady Ghostbusters, it started with the books, actually, the Sussex County Haunting series that I wrote. I wanted to do stuff that was local, that nobody really knew about, people's personal experiences. I felt, well, these are, like you said, active haunts that are going on in people's homes and in their businesses. And that's how it started. And it just took off. And like you, I've been investigating places that are just ordinary businesses locally. And they're just mm -hmm. as intriguing. Nobody else knows about them. And they're people are reading about them and they're like oh my gosh i know that place i didn't know it was haunted yep. so I, I do i do like unearthing the new spots that nobody just even thought about before Absolutely. i know um that you mentioned earlier though that you your second investigation was probably the most frightening experience that you guys have ever had mm -hmm. where was that and what happened that was in a very old 200 year old actually more than 200 years old now probably more like 230 years old <laughs> cemetery called unity cemetery in Fort Mill, South Carolina, old Unity Cemetery. And I had seen this on the on the internet just as a historical place near where I lived when I was living in South Carolina. So I said, let me go check this thing out. And I would say that the entire cemetery was no more than a half acre square. But when you went into this thing, you got an incredible feeling, which it, which I'm sure you're familiar with. When, you, when you're in a haunted location, many times you could just feel it. And I felt it. And we had just gotten off of doing our first investigation, which was a very positive experience. So we said, oh, let's go to this place. So we went there and we went there around dusk and we went there with really nothing but two things. An app, uh, one of the earliest ghost radar apps, which was for the iPhone, which is like the very first one that ever came out. And Nikki was using that and an EMF detector. That's all we had. And of course, a video camera. So those three 
three things. And we went there and we were getting this very oppressive feeling and we were going around and all of a sudden Courtney, who had the EMF detector, went. she went near this one spot in the cemetery and the thing just went bonkers. And then she stepped back and we walked around and nothing happened. We went back to that one area again and we started getting activity again. So all of a sudden I asked the entity, if it was a ghost, can you answer some questions? And it started doing that interactive thing with the EMF detector that a lot of people use K2s for, you know, come towards the come towards this unit and then back away that kind of thing and we asked it to ping once for yes two for no on the needle and it was doing it and i all of a sudden we were asking questions and i don't know what possessed me to ask this spirit would you like us to leave and the thing it made this crazy loud noise and literally jumped out of my hand Mm. and and all of a sudden the entire family freaked because they knew (laughs) and we left and it was the quietest car ride on the way home we have ever had. They just wouldn't talk. They, they knew what happened. And we went back there <laughs> later oh, and we did, did su- subsequent investigation. And we've probably gotten our best, some of our best evidence in that little tiny cemetery, including the very best EVP. Not only have we ever caught, but I've, I've ever heard anybody else ever catch. And I talk about it in the Family Spirits and you can hear it on the web series. It's an episode called We Were Not Alone. And it was when Renee and I went alone it was just us two at this time. And we were trying to field test a new paranormal app and we weren't getting anything. We thought the whole thing was a bust. And little did I know that I had a digital recorder uh, by that time and I had it running and I forgot to turn it off. So I get back to our house and I noticed that this thing was still running. And I said, ah, well, let me download the audio file. I download the audio file and I start doing evidence review. And I'm laughing as I'm listening to Renee and I tripping over things, trying to get out of the cemetery before it gets completely dark. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, a third voice comes into the mix. It sounded very close to the recorder. We sounded far away because it was in my pocket, but this thing sounded like it was right up against the mic. And it was a wispy, ethereal, female voice that said, come back. Don't leave now. As clear as you and I are talking. Oh, boy. Yes. Relevance. We were leaving the cemetery, and it was something telling us not to go. It was two complete sentences. And if you listen to it, you could actually hear the enunciation of the of the words. And we were just recently at uh, Phenom 2020 down in Gettysburg, which is Jason Hawes' event promoting family spirits. And we had someone come up to the booth and we were talking about the web series and the book and everything. And she started talking about EVPs. And I said, well, I, I said, at the risk of sounding whatever, I said, I think I have one of the best EVPs that was that has ever been caught. And she, and she was like, yeah, sure. OK. And I said, would you like to hear it? She said, yeah. Yeah, sure. So I had my laptop there and I pulled up the web series and I just pulled up the, the episode of the web series. And I, I went to the part where I play the EVP and I got halfway through the EVP and she said, stop, stop right now. She goes, shut it off, shut it off. I said, why? She goes, I've never heard anything like that in my life. <laughs> and <laughs> I, she goes, that's amazing. I said, yeah. I said, especially when it was caught by mistake. I had absolutely no idea it was even happening. I didn't even ask for it. Now, something like that, finding out about it after the fact would bother me so much. I would feel so bad because the spirit was asking you not to leave, to come back. Did you feel bad about it after the fact? Well, we went back there a number of times and we finally deduced the name of the ghost and her name was Nancy. We even know where her grave is. And she's given us a lot of great evidence. But here's the thing. I'll tell you what makes me feel bad on an investigation is not knowing how to help these spirits because a lot of them, they're earthbound for a reason that we don't know what it is. And sometimes they'll tell you, but more times than not, when I ask them, how we can help them, communication stops. I talk about it in Family Spirits. It happens all the time. I call it forbidden knowledge because it almost seems as though they're being prevented from asking or relaying certain information to us. Like you could contact an entity on an investigation and they will answer certain things. But whenever you come to real critical information like how can I help you or, you know, is this purgatory for you being, you know, trapped on earth or is is this hell? or is this heaven? I mean, who knows? You never get the answers to those questions that they just leave every time you start to ask those questions. And that kind of makes me feel bad because then I'm like, what kind of state are they in where they can't answer these questions? 
I have different people on my team that, like I said, are gifted different ways. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing this, some of them for 40 years. They have experience. I don't have as much experience as them. And I don't, I don't claim to be as gifted as they are either. I have my certain gifts that I can add to the equation. But like I said, some of these people are just way gifted. And they've told me that there are spirits that choose to stay here and spirits that would like to go, but just don't know how. And so we, what we try to do for those that want to leave is accept explain to them about the light and trying to get them to see the light so they can go into it. Some of them know the light's there and are afraid to go into it for whatever reason. We had an investigation at one point where the spirit was a gay Catholic man who took uh, his life uh. and was afraid to go into the light because he was afraid that he was going to be rejected and outcasted because he was a gay who was Catholic. And it was really, really a sad thing to have to listen to, but we mm. explained to him that there's love in the light and all acceptance and you have no fear of that. The second time we went back, the other spirits that were there that night told us that he had went into the light. Oh, that's wonderful. So maybe that'll help you along the way too someday, maybe realizing that there is a light there and some of them just need guidance to find it. True. But yeah, I can imagine how that would be upsetting that they're stuck. And I do believe there are definitely instances where ghosts are almost imprisoned mm -hmm. by stronger spirits that don't want them to go and they can't go anywhere and they can't even say or speak their mind. Like we just did an investigation the other night where there was an elderly man who was trying to talk to us, but there was a crazy spirit there that we were really unsure of what it was or if it ever was human that wouldn't let this man say what he wanted to say. Right. That to me is a scary, a really scary investigation. I'm like, <laughs> <Yeah>. oh gosh. <laughs> you know, especially when one of the women can see, but actually one of the women and, and the young man who's, he's our trainee, he's really young he's a newbie but he's very talented the two of them could see this thing and it almost reminded me of those the scary movies that they have where they have like the creature like crawling on the floor this is what this thing looked like <sighs> right, and, and, right. and it took the shape of, it took the shape of a little boy and that was the creepy part about it too that it was taking the shape of a little boy and it wasn't even a little boy i couldn't live in a house like that if i knew there were spirits that's one thing but if i find out there's something like that you got to get it out of here or I, i'm getting out of here <laughs> <laughs> You know, I hear you. <laughs> I'm always making sure my house is clean because, you know, you can bring home stuff with you. I, I mean, I've got my protective rocks and I wear my quartz bracelet and I have my protective oils and kin seeds and all that. So I have all that stuff, but I still worry because my family isn't as enthusiastic as your family is. <laughs> my husband is, he's one of those believer, non-believers. My daughter, who I feel is gifted because she has had things happen to her. So she it has ability, but she's afraid of it and right. i know my older daughter is gifted too i'm the only one that likes to go out and <laughs> do the adventuring part of, of the deal <laughs> i have to keep them safe at home you know what i'm saying <laughs> i do i know exactly what you're saying what was your favorite investigation your most favorite boy that's a tough one i have so many favorites and i have so many great memories investigating so many cool experiences i'm gonna have to say it's the one investigation that if anyone asks me well i'm gonna go to your web series which one should I watch? Because there's 50 episodes. And some of them are, I would say, they borderline mundane because I like to put it all out there. I want people to see the whole scope of ghost hunting because sometimes investigations can be pretty boring. But there are other investigations that will blow your mind. And it's the one that will blow your mind that I always send them to. It's called The Hidden Grave of Thomas Sprott. And it's the one that I alluded to earlier where we asked a spirit to pose for a picture, and it did. And it was also... The one investigation where I personally was the most frightened, not the family, because I did a preliminary investigation alone in this private family plot that I got permission to investigate and it had a reputation for being haunted. And uh, they would say mists would come up from the graves, and but nobody investigated it because it was on private land. So I went to the landowners. It was in, it was in the South. It was a big stately plantation. And when I explained to the owner, her name was Alexis, what who I was and what I wanted to do, she gave me permission to go there and investigate. So I went there alone at first, and all I had was my uh, 
um, camera that I had on video mode and an EMF detector. And it was in the middle of the woods. And as I was approaching the gate to this little family plot, my EMF detector started going off. And the closer I got to the gate, the louder the EMF detector started going. I put the EMF detector down on the cemetery gate post, backed away, and this thing was just going crazy. And I have all this on video. But the thing about it was I couldn't enter the gate. I couldn't go in. Something was keeping me out. It wasn't a physical thing. Oh. It, was, it was this feeling that do not come in here. I literally, the sweat started, I don't sweat, but sweat started coming down the side of my face and the hair on the back of my neck was standing up and the, a feeling unlike anything I had ever experienced in my entire life came over me, warning me not to go into that cemetery. So I took it, I left, I came back with Renee, she had the rods at the time and we opened up a communication with the spirit and we asked him, "Would can we go in, we have permission from one of your ancestors to, and he said yes. And wouldn't you know, immediately the EMF detector stopped. Boom. And I was able to go in. So then we left again. Third time we came back with the entire family and we brought flowers to this gentleman's grave. He died 200 years ago. He was a hero in the Revolutionary War. Incredible backstory. And we asked him midway through the, and he, it was crazy. Renee goes, I don't know if you remember, it was me and Bob came here earlier. Both of her rods turned and pointed at me. <laughs> it was the craziest thing I ever saw. And we asked him midway through the investigation, can we take a picture of you? And through the rods, he said, yes. So Nikki G, my oldest daughter, had an infrared camera and she was snapping shots. All of a sudden, she started seeing things through the viewfinder. She's like, dad, you got to see this. And I'm like, not now, honey. We'll do evidence review later. She goes, no, you have to see this right now. <laughs> she was seeing this thing manifest through the viewfinder in infrared, but we couldn't see it with the naked eye. And it started out as an orb. Then it blew up into an ectoplasm cloud that was com almost completely blocking Renee. And then in the last shot, there he was, a full human figure wearing a cloak, standing right next to me, as tall as me. Probably our best piece of evidence we've ever gotten. And I have a picture of it in Family Spirits. It's, it's in there. And so you can see it. You can also see it if you watch the web series. But that, it was really the investigation of a lifetime when you put all these elements together. You can even see the part mm. where, where the ghost really just scared the crap out of me in the beginning. I, 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 I <laughs> That's in the very beginning of the episode. I definitely love when things come full circle, though, when that story that you've started somewhere and eventually comes to fruition that you understand mm -hmm. who it was and what they were trying to tell you. That's just like the, the greatest thing. And I got a similar picture in a cemetery as well. It was the oh, Deckertown cool. Cemetery here in Sussex. And it was just a night that the metaphysical store in the area was having this cemetery investigation and anybody could go that wanted to go. You had to sign up for it. So it was early on when I first started doing this stuff and I was in the middle of writing the first book and I thought, well, I'm going to go do that. And I took my daughter Cassidy with me and her friend and it was one of those perfect nights. It was in October. It was not really cold out. The moon was bright. It was just the perfect atmosphere for this investigation. And here we are in the middle of the night walking around the cemetery. I thought I was going to be freaked out in the cemetery, but I was just so at peace. It was really like very comforting actually. I think that's a surprising thing to say, but that's how I felt. And just snap it away because they tell you, you know, snap three or four pictures, one right after the other, because at one time you might catch something and it might be gone in the next frame. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I must have went home with like a hundred pictures. And when I got home, I started going through them. And then I got this one picture, this great photo of this guy, handsome ghost. Let me tell you, he was wearing an ascot and he was wearing a cape, just like you're saying, and riding boots. And he was standing kind of like that picture you see of George Washington standing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh gosh, who the heck are you? It was a great picture. And that I have in my first book too, because I was That's so excited awesome. that I had found this. <laughs> That's great. They yeah. are once in a lifetime pictures. You really need to treasure those things because they're not easy to get. You are going to have people that say, oh, I, I don't believe that. Oh, you probably created that picture somehow. But I mean, I know it. And I have a thing. I'm, I'm really, one of the things I'm really good at is seeing things in windows and mirrors. So if I have I take a picture, I can zone in and I'll find something. And that's one of my gifts, I guess you could say. And I get some really good pictures. And some people can see them because to me, they're as clear as day. Some people can see them and some people say they don't see anything. I think that's just whether somebody's open-minded about something or, or not. That's how right. I feel it. Well, well, I, 
I think it actually may go a little bit deeper than that. The problem is a lot. You know, remember when we were talking about public speaking in the beginning of the interview? Yeah. You were saying a lot of people are afraid to public speak. Well, that might be one of the biggest fears people have, but one of the top five fears is phasmophobia, which is the fear of ghosts. Sometimes it's also called spectrophobia. And here's the thing. There are people that don't believe, not because they don't believe your evidence. It's because they don't want to believe. Some people are, there's an innate fear, and I guess it's linked to the fear of death in a way, but some people are absolutely terrified of the thought of ghosts. In fact, I had a knockdown drag out fight with a skeptic on one of my YouTube videos, and it went on forever. And then he finally fessed up and he goes, look, dude, I don't believe because I don't want to believe. He goes, the thought of being a disembodied spirit after I die is absolutely terrifying to me. He would prefer oblivion to the thought of being a spirit. And some people do. Some people do. And that's a pervasive fear. People don't want to admit it, but I'm pretty good at reading people. And I pretty much know when they're disagreeing with me because they don't want to believe versus my evidence. I never knew that. That's, That's an interesting fact. You just taught me something. A little while ago, my paranormal team did an investigation at the Diva Dog Boutique at the shops at Lafayette in Lafayette, New Jersey. I'm pretty sure the owner, Francesca, told me you guys had been there as well. Is yep. that true that you did an investigation there too? Yes, we did. In fact, it's, ah. on, it's on our web series. It's on an episode that we just simply entitled Lafayette. And that was our first public investigation that we had ever done. And Family Spirits was just published. I mean, it was fresh off the the presses. And Patty Singer, who runs the Lafayette Village over there, the old shops at Lafayette, and she set it up. She set up a book signing for us. So we went and I did a lecture and the lecture went so well that I am kicking myself for not recording it. I recorded everything and I didn't record that. But we did this lecture, we sold some books, and then we did a public investigation in that pet boutique. And uh, Francesca, the owner, told everybody the history. And then we started doing the investigation and I was using a ghost box. We started with a spirit box and (laughs) the sounds that were coming through this spirit box were so crazy that one of the gentlemen who was a a layman, he wasn't a paranormal investigator, he says, I am genuinely freaked out right now. He was so afraid. And, but we had a whole bunch of people in this tiny little pet shop and we were getting like some great evidence. And here's an interesting thing. We don't always know if these spirits are telling us the truth because obviously we don't know who they are. We don't know what we're talking to when we're out there. But I will tell you that the spirit ultimately told us he was Lafayette himself. Whether or not he was, I have no idea. But that's what he told us. So that's why we named it Lafayette. And it was an awesome investigation. And you can see that if you go to our web series. That whole location that shopping mall is on is very, very active. We've since done a couple investigations in there since the Dog Diva Pet Boutique. And I'm telling you, it's not just one ghost either, because that used to be a thoroughfare for the train. And so you had people in it out. You had people working there. And we were picking up several spirits when my team was there. For the listening audience, Francesca opened up her pet boutique business in 2018, and she started seeing and feeling activity immediately after opening her shop. Two previous store owners in the same location had claimed to have experienced activity as well. My Lady Ghostbuster team went there in January of 2020, and I think you had been there not too much before that. I think it was probably the October or something before It was. It was. And yep, um, yep. my medium, R. Peterson, he felt that thoroughfare of the activity all around the property. He felt it was really? that prime location. And I have to say, you know, she had these bells that were hanging on the door. I don't know if she mentioned that to you when you guys yeah. were there. She had bells yeah. that were hanging on the door. And they, they were meant to, when somebody would come into the door, they were rattled. But she had them on a door that she never used. That door was always locked. She had another entrance that was used for people coming in and out of. But those bells would go off on their own. And the night that we were there, it happened with us. She had sent us a video showing this is what's going on. This is what happens. And so obviously we were hoping that would happen when we went there that night. And it did. The bell went off. And we tried to debunk it on video and there was no debunking it. We couldn't figure out why it was happening, obviously, other than spirit activity. I wouldn't be surprised about this Lafayette guy because somebody who was very, very important in the community. Mm-hmm. I, I, we didn't get a name, but it could very well have been the Lafayette that you could. He was a big guy, important guy. Yep. And we also got a young woman and a young man and their story was what came through to us that night and we ended up finding 
the graves in the cemetery across the street. We actually first found the grave of the female and their child together and didn't know why we couldn't find him. But it wasn't until we actually went looking that we discovered his right there with her, oh, cool. which was interesting. That's how I say to you when something comes full circle. It's I, I love when that happens. Yeah, during that investigation, you know, through the ghost box, we actually had the spirit say, go home to Paris. And I didn't even interpret that. One of the people in the audience said, he just said, go home to Paris. And I said, that's what he said, didn't he? He said, yeah. So, I mean, the uncanny relevance to say, I'm Lafayette, and then all of a sudden he's saying he wants to go home to Paris. Right. What? How can you, you know, you put these evidence strings together, which is what I call them in family spirits, and you come really close to scientific proof, in my opinion. Because, you know, people say, well, there's no scientific proof of ghosts. I said, yeah, but there's mountains of evidence. And I said, anecdotal evidence, ITC evidence, photographs, evidence, video evidence, um, personal experience. I said there's more than enough evidence to prove the existence of spirits in a court of law. Is it scientific mm -hmm. proof? No, because that's a totally different thing. You can't put a ghost in a Petri dish. But if you want the same type of evidence that you could actually, per, you know, make a case with, you know, we have it. Right. Oh, I agree. I even remember Francesca mentioning that the scan gun that they would use to scan items into the register, it would beep on its own. Even even though someone had to use it in order to use it, they had to manually click it to scan something. But oftentimes it would just go off and beep on its own. And then the second floor office upstairs had a lot of noisy activity going on. Furniture would move around during off hours. Doors would be heard opening and closing. And Francesca phoned the manager on one occasion to ask if someone else was scheduled on shift upstairs and was told the place was empty. So they're hearing all this stuff. And she got a lot of stuff on video that she had sent me previous to us going to the investigation, I guess, to try and entice us to come to the building and do our own investigation. One was the dogs reacting, barking to things that weren't visually seen right. by the people around there. So it was definitely an, an active area. I did go into the store recently. She's not in there any longer. And there's some other clothing shop in there. And I went in to ask, has anything happened? And they said, oh, not, no, not as of yet. So I left my card. I said, well, if it does, you can give me a call. <laughs> Yeah, I would actually like to go back and do another investigation without all of the people that we had during the public investigation. And it's easier to concentrate, uh, a little more quiet, but there's definitely something there for sure. I also would love to do a nighttime investigation in the cemetery across the street. I did contact the historical society, but they never got back to me because I just I want to make sure that the cops know that I have permission to be there. <laughs> you know, after talk, yeah. New, New Jersey can be a little funny that way. Yeah, you know what? You're a lot better than I am because we just go in. <laughs> and I think we just, we'll, we'll just say we're paranormal investigators. We've never been approached by police yet, but we have been approached by other people like, oh, what are you guys doing? Well, we're paranormal investigators and we're just here doing an investigation. If I was going into a building, it would be a different story. But for cemeteries, we just kind of like go in. <laughs> Where are you located now yourself? I'm in Rosetto, Pennsylvania, which is basically right over the border. Uh, you know, I'm like oh, six okay. miles six miles up the road once you uh, go over the Portland, Pennsylvania bridge. Gotcha. So you're not far away that you could actually come over and do it if you wanted to. You should check out Decker Town, Papa Kating on Route 23. Oh, I, I would definitely, you know, go up there and do it for sure. And it's not far from me. I went there and I did a Facebook Live investigation just myself around dusk. And there's an old metal shed in the back of that cemetery. And I was getting these loud bangs. And people during the Facebook Live were hearing them. They're like, what is that? I said, I have no idea, but I don't know what's making these loud bangs on this in the shed. I was right next to it when I was trying to communicate. It was bang, bang. And I was like, wow, I got to come back. And Wait, that was at the Lafayette Cemetery you were mm -hmm. talking about? Yes. Yeah. Because from when you're down at the bottom, it kind of looks like it's going to be really big. When you walk up the hill and you actually get to the cemetery, it's right. not big at all. No, it's not. And it was just Brittany, my team member, Brittany Iwanski and I, when we went back there, because we had done an investigation at Brick and Mortar Marketplace in the little town of Lafayette. And then we had done the one I was just talking to you about at the pet boutique. And we had names. So we really wanted to go and look and see if we could connect mostly with the Hockenberry name, which is what we had connected with at 
like brick and mortar. That's what we were going to the cemetery for. And when we walked in, we found a feather on the floor. For me, feathers are always gifts. And if mm. we follow the feathers, it'll help us find what it is that they want us to find. And sure enough, we were following feathers around the cemetery, which led us right to the young woman and the man who we connected with from the pet boutique. And we weren't even there looking for them. But we found him that day. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And we yeah, thanked them yeah. because we didn't know he was in the cemetery there with her and their son. And then on our way out, we thought, wow, there's that corner is calling to us. Let's go in that corner. And we went into the corner and there we found the ha- Hockenberry one, which was really interesting, too. So there was two investigations that came full circle for us just that day. That's awesome. Yeah. Have you guys ever used an SLS camera? Because our Brittany is into the SLS camera and our Margaret is into it. So <laughs> it, I find it fascinating. I mean, you can stand in front of the camera, obviously, and you can see yourself as a skeleton person. But if you're not in front of the camera and nobody else is and you see a skeleton person <laughs> or a stick figure person, right? it's a spirit. Yeah, I mean, I just started using SLS, believe it or not. I mean, after all this time, because I sometimes I get a little bit stubborn. I know what works for me and for us, and I kind of stick with those things. But I said recently, I need to branch out and, and use some other things. So I just started using SLS and also started using a very unique piece of equipment by Gary Galko, who makes the Mel meters. And it, it's a new thermal, believe it or not, it's a professional thermal version of Ghost Radar. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Gary Galka designed it. And if you know anything about Gary Galka, he lost his daughter tragically in a car accident. And he's an electronics genius. He owns a company that makes precision electronic uh, measuring equipment for corporations. He made it his life's mission to find something that could contact his daughter. This is the guy who invented the SB7 spirit box. And anything you get from him, these are not toys. he's, Mm -hmm. He's serious when he makes these things. But this new piece of equipment is just amazing. It's like my new favorite paranormal piece of equipment because, you know, people look at Ghost Rider and they're like, ah, oh, Ghost Radar. And I get it. I get it. I totally get it. But now they can't say that. And because we always like to use something like this as a lead to point us in the direction of where something might be happening and then pursue that lead with other pieces of equipment. But I started using SLS as well. And I get the concept behind SLS. It will, anything that it thinks is a human figure, it will create that stick figure. But people are using that as an excuse to debunk it. And I tell them, I'm like, no, you you don't understand. To your point, if there's nothing there and it's making that stick figure, that means something is there that it's interpreting as a human. Right. I said, so you shouldn't discount it. And I just recently used it up at Sleepy Hot, the old Dutch church cemetery in Sleepy Hollow, New York, because my day job brings me to cool places. So like I'll venture out on my own during my work hours. Hope my boss isn't listening. Hey, this is the cemetery where the sleepy, where the headless horseman, according to Washington Irving, is supposed to tether his horse every night. What people don't realize about the headless horseman is that it's not just the tail. It's based on an old Dutch story that is supposed to be real. What I did is I went up there and I did some deduction. I said to myself, I said, okay, if the old Hessian soldier that lost his head with a cannonball during the Revolutionary War is buried in his churchyard, which the story says it is, I said, where would he be buried? I said, well, he would be buried close to the church because now the the cemetery goes long, very expansive. But back in the day, it wasn't. So I said, it would have to be close to the church. I said, it would have to be close to the one tree that is at least 200 years old. So there's only one tree that could be 200 years old. So it says, it's got to be around here. And there has to be a break in the cemetery stones because it's it's supposed to be an unmarked grave. However, the church people during that time would know where he was buried. So they wouldn't dig Mm -hmm. up his body trying to bury someone else. They would know where it was even though it was unmarked. So I found a break in the cemetery stones, set up the SLS, tried to contact, and wouldn't you know, I got that stick figure right in that exact spot. Wow, that was good deduction on your part. I don't know if it's the headless horseman spirit, but hey, you know. You never know. You never know. We use the SLS camera on our investigation in Sophie G's Antiques, which is in the shops at Lafayette. And it's an antique shop, so you figure it's going to be loaded with stuff, especially since the owner, Corey, does no saging on anything when he brings it in. Mm -hmm. And he reached out to us to come do an investigation because he was having this issue with 
screwdriver that kept disappearing and showing up in odd places. No matter where he would put it down, it would show up somewhere else. So we said, well, we'll come over and check and see what you have going on. And we encountered several children ghosts. And the one that was messing around with the screwdriver was Jacob. And Jacob Mm. wanted Corey to keep that screwdriver behind the counter where it was safe that whenever he wanted to use the screwdriver, he could use it. So now Corey and his wife come in every day and they say hello to Jacob and the kids because they feel like they have an orphanage in their antique shop. But getting back to the SLS camera, we have on the the SLS camera, I'm behind Margaret. So Margaret's got the SLS camera and she's focusing the camera on these items hanging from the ceiling. There was a pram hanging from the ceiling. There was a blow up in inflatable blimp and then there was a birdcage next to each other and they kept swinging so she's focusing the sls camera on the bram at this point that that's swaying and i'm behind her so i've got a visual of this pram swaying and her sls camera with the stick figures hanging from this pram which was really phenomenal stuff because mm. we knew that these kids were hanging from this pram swinging it but you couldn't see them when you look to the right of the camera when you when you look on her camera you see the stick that you're swinging from them. So I know people are going to say, oh, that's not true, but you really can't debunk that. There's something there that's swinging from this thing. It's just amazing. It is amazing. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of great paranormal application for SLS, especially in conjunction with other equipment, for sure. Oh, yeah. They have a lot of stuff out there now. They have very loud and noisy stuff that just, to me, when it's calmer and more quiet and we can hear ourselves think. And Mm -hmm. so we we do the the audio like you do, or that kind of stuff, I feel is more effective than the noise stuff in my opinion but i like a spirit box but they have some other stuff that's just like really it was like wah, wah. And i'm like i don't even know what the heck it's supposed to do and it's more aggravating than it's worth to me so yeah. but whatever works for somebody some some people have stuff that they just I they, agree. they like it I, don't I actually don't like the sp7 spirit box to me it's so tedious i can never understand anything that's happening in the moment i always have to do evidence review and something will come through you know you have to ask five people what did they think it said i have have far more luck with things like the Ovilus apps. And let me yes. tell you, I have gotten just mind-blowing evidence with Ovilus apps. And the reason I like them is because, A, unlike EVP, it doesn't suffer from sound contamination. You know exactly what it says, unlike the SB7 spirit box. And I know they work. We had one episode called Grave Matters, and we were in Asheville, North Carolina. And we had just got done investigating a haunted Masonic Lodge which was mind-blowing investigation. But the person who was with us on the investigation says, you have to check out the cemetery. There are loads of ghosts in the cemetery. That's all I had to hear. So we went up to the cemetery (laughs) and uh, (laughs) there was this mausoleum on the top of the hill. And for some reason, like you, I felt drawn to it. So we went up Mm -hmm. there and when we got up there, we noticed that three of the niches were broken into and there were no bodies in there. There was no caskets, no nothing. And I'm, I'm like, wow, what happened here? We had our Ovilus app on at the time, and it's called the Ghost Speaker, and it's made by Krugism. And Danny Krug, who designed it, I know him personally. I've corresponded with him. He's the one who designed and built the app. It's not a toy. And all of a sudden, we're trying to see what's going on and what spirits were present. And all of a sudden, an, uh, a word came through that said 11, the number, the number 11. I said, 11? I said, what could that possibly mean? Now, if anybody in your audience doesn't know how an Ovilus works, there's a built-in dictionary of about 2,000 words. And theory has it, the spirit goes in, picks out a word, and there's your word. So I said, why did it say 11? And my daughter taps me and said, Dad, look at the last name. The last name was Elavine. Oh. Only an extra E. And since Elavine, the last name, would not be in the dictionary, the spirit picked out the closest closest word. Yeah. Wow. What are the odds? Now, the odds of that happening at random are 1 in 2,000. But the odds of that happening to match match the name on a mausoleum mm-hmm. is literally mm-hmm. beyond calculation. Okay. Then it's we ask. It's not a coincidence. There's no way. There's no I way. I don't believe in coincidences. And, yeah. and that's that's why in Family Spirits, I, uh, I when I described that episode, I said the phone app that named the dead because it did. And then I asked what happened to the mausoleum. And you know what the next word was? Witchcraft. Oh. Yes. Wow. I hear a-, a lot of that. Asheville is known for its Wiccan population. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? You find that everywhere, though. You know, in Milford, Pennsylvania, too, there's a lot of that has been known to happen over the years in cemeteries. Mausoleum being broken in on prominent figures of the past in that 
area. So I, yeah, I, I understand where that came from. But you know, the ovulus is good, especially since we used one the other night and the words coming out of it, there's, it can't be a coincidence no. because you're talking about a certain thing going on and these words come out that, I mean, it could be just random stuff, but these words are significant to what we're talking about and what we're saying and what we're experiencing. And, and that's the thing. So, Danny Krug, who um, designed this app, he goes, you know, I designed it. He goes, and I don't even know why it works so good. And I talk about it in Family Spirits. I have several theories. I do think these spirits tap into universal intelligence and in metaphysical science. They call it the morphic field, which is basically the concept that we are all tapping into this big knowledge center, that our brains are just receivers, and that even a 200-year-old spirit will know how to ping the needle on an EMF detector because it just knows. And mm-hmm. it's the same concept as a spider. When a spider is only moments old, it can build this engineering marvel that is in a location perfectly suited to capturing prey. And you ask scientists, how can a spider build a web like that when nobody taught it? And the scientists will say, well, it's in their DNA. We could see DNA under a microscope. Can somebody tell me where the spider web blueprints are? Because they're not, you know, they're not there. Nobody could really understand the science really doesn't have answers to these things. My theory and the theory of a lot of others is that everything taps into this universal field of knowledge. They just know. They've had a lot of time to educate themselves too. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And it very well could be that. I mean, we don't know, obviously. We're sailing in uncharted waters, but you mm-hmm. could be absolutely correct there as well. We don't know. We don't know. We're still trying to find these answers. Right. You mentioned earlier that Gary had created those different devices because he was trying to connect with his deceased daughter. Correct. Do you have any knowledge of whether he did or not, if he was able to? I believe he thinks he did. He was on Ghost Adventures a couple times, which I can't find a couple felt a little weird about them doing that episode, but he consented to it, so I guess it's okay. But, like, right during the episode, when SB7, you, you hear a young girl's voice saying, hi, Dad, but he hasn't given up the fight for sure because he keeps coming out with new things. And what I really like about his equipment, he's not doing it to, to turn a profit. He's doing it because he really feels like he's helping this effort that we are a part of, this endeavor to, to prove the afterlife. Some of us already know it's there, but, you know, a little bit more validation never hurt. Sure. I think we are really right on the cusp of really proving this stuff scientifically. You know, they say, well, there's no repeatable scientific evidence. I said, yeah, but I get pretty reliable, repeatable evidence when I'm out with certain pieces of equipment. I said, so, you know, I mean, I don't know how you want to view that, but if you could explain it, explain it, but nobody's been able to so far. It's irrefutable. Yep. Well, didn't Houdini always want to try and find connection with somebody from his past? Yes, his wife. Was it Um, that he was trying? He actually made a, a pact with his wife on his deathbed and he whispered a code in her ear. He says, if I come back, I'm going to give this code to the medium. If the medium says it, you know I'm there. And some people say it happened. Some people say it didn't. And the thing about Houdini is it's problematic. If you know, if you ever read anything about metaphysics, they say that we, in in part, create our own afterlife. If you're a skeptic and you die thinking there's nothing afterward, then maybe that's going to be your experience. And maybe mm. I think the, yeah. the intent really has to be there and the desire really has to be there. And I don't think it was in Houdini's case because every year at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, they have a Houdini seance and they've never contacted him. But I know for a fact that everybody sitting at that table is a diehard skeptic. And you know and I know that you have to go there mm. with the intention that you're going to get that evidence because oh, yeah. if you're a skeptic, yeah. you won't. Exactly. And that's part of the problem for sure. It is. Mm. Like I've had skeptics say, well, I was on a ghost hunt and I didn't experience anything. I said, because they're not trained circus animals there to convince you. I said, people have a story to tell and if you're not going to help them they could care less about you this is what I tell these skeptics yeah but we approach them sincerely with a sincere desire to get communication and we get it I hate to be simplistic about it but it's pretty much as simple as that very true have you ever brought anything home with you by accident those dowsing rods I told you about (laughs) I have two cardinal rules that I talk about in family spirits number one is never ghost hunt at home because you can invite something into your home that you might not be able to get rid of. That's why mm-hmm. I tell people, I don't think seances at home are a good idea. Using the rods, using pendulums, Ouija boards, anything like that, save it for the investigation. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. My other mm-hmm. cardinal rule is Great. do not do not take anything home from an investigation. Like, don't say, oh, 
oh, look at that cool rock next to that tombstone. I'm going to take <laughs> that home because you, mm-hmm. you could be taking an attachment home with you. That's my other rule. Don't do that. It's a ritual with me. I Before I leave, it's like I say, you're not allowed to come home with me. You have to stay here. This I do the same thing. Because I've heard too many stories from people that, you know, haven't done that or they've actually invited something back with them and you don't want me. And I'm totally against Ouija boards too. I'm just too crazy to work with something like that. You can just, you'd be inviting something. You could be inviting something really bad in. Well, here's the thing about Ouija boards, the rods and pendulums. And I use a pendulum, so saying not to use it because then I'd be a hypocrite. But they're called conduit forms of communication. It's different than communicating with an EMF detector or an electronic piece of equipment, because in that case, the spirit is interacting directly with the equipment. But in the case of the three I mentioned, the spirit is working through you to make that work. You are the conduit. Micromuscular movements, and in Renee's case, they were so slight that they couldn't even be detected, but I believe that's what they were. But it's the spirit influencing the person to make these things move. With that comes an inherent risk and that risk is attachment. You just got to be careful. Right. That's really the bottom line. But I talk about that in family spirits too. Because I've had a lot of people say, well, it's the same thing if you're using an EMF detector. I said, only in the sense that you're trying to communicate and that technically it's a seance. I get that part. When it comes to the actual mechanics, there is a difference. Makes sense. Why don't you tell our listening audience how they can find out more about you and the Gallo family ghost hunting adventures? There's a lot of ways. And I used to go through this whole litany of websites and I realized that wasn't the, <laughs> wasn't the right thing to do. So I'm only to give people <laughs> two websites. They're the only two you need to know. The number one is to go to our web series. You go to ghosthunter.ws. WS stands for website. So ghosthunter.ws. That is the web series. And you can watch all 50 episodes. And you can even watch it on TV. If you have an Amazon Fire Stick or a Roku box, you just go to the Rumble app and type in Gallo Family Ghost Hunters. You can watch the whole web series on TV or on your phone or on your computer at Ghost Hunter. WS. The second site is familyspiritsbook.com. That's familyspiritsbook.com. And that is the publisher's website for our book. You can't get it through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, all those places. But if you go to familyspiritsbook.com and you enter the promo code 2021, we'll give you 21% off the cover price. That's really the way to go. That really brings it down to almost cost for us for the book. We want to get it in as many people's hands as possible. I can't wait to read my copy. And I have to say, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. And I want to thank you so much for offering me some time to do so. Oh, the pleasure was mine. And please, when you read the book, you know, shoot me a Facebook messenger or something like that and tell me what you thought, because I, I'm always looking for feedback, especially oh, somebody absolutely. as much as experienced as you. I mean, that's great. I love when other paranormal investigators uh, give me feedback because it's it's been pretty successful. We hit number three in the adventure travel category on Amazon with it. And, ah, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's been a pretty good ride. It's probably more more layman than actual paranormal investigators who've read the book, to be honest. Well, because they're, they're curious, I'm sure. I'm sure curiosity Absolutely. has a lot to do with it. Well, this was fun, Bobby. Thank you again. Thank you, paranormal enthusiasts, for tuning in today. I hope you'll come back again. Remember to tap into your own gifts. Everyone has them. And in the meantime, make sure you're creeping it real. <laughs>